Thanks, Mary. So it sounds like I'm on. You can hear me? Yes. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted you could be here. Thanks for attending. And I'm uh, going to give you an update on our commercial market uh, forecast. And I want you to read this carefully. Because <laughs> surely I want you to read this carefully. Because Danielle wants to. <laughs> but I won't, uh, I won't make you read it carefully. But I'm going to go over the current market environment and, uh, and then get into a commercial aircraft uh, market uh, more specifically. Um, and then I'm actually going to talk about our products a bit. And uh, I think uh, you're... Uh, Looking forward to that. One one of the uh, perspectives we probably should uh, put <clears throat> on the forecast is, uh, you know, the fact that we're coming out of this uh, significant downturn. And when you look at our market, so that's up to 150 seats, 149 seats, we say. Uh, you know, the overall deliveries for this market were down 29% uh, from the previous year. So the real impact of the last recession, you know, really hit us last year and we're still working our way through that. I think as I've talked many times before, you know, we are, we lag the economic cycle significantly. And uh, we lagged going in, so we kept production up while everybody else was uh, suffering and then now our production has come down um, while things are starting to look up. Um, I would also remind everybody that we launched uh, the C-Series in 2008 and uh, sort of true to form, at least for me, and I used to say this at Boeing, uh, that whenever Boeing launched a new program, it would, you were guaranteed to go into a recession. Well, I sort of carried that over into uh, Bombardier, so when we launched the C-Series, sure enough, we had the Great Recession, which... Uh, which uh, manifests itself in our current product uh, production, uh, but uh, which makes it uh, difficult in a, a heavy uh, development period. You know, I would also add uh, that uh, it looked like Boeing was going to buck the odds because uh, when they launched the 787, uh, the economy just kept growing and it was doing well. So they decided to delay the introduction of it for another three years so they could keep their record uh, intact. <laughs> but uh, but it, it is, uh, it is uh, important to remember that despite the fact that we look at a constant number over the next 20 years, every decade has had a cycle. We don't try to predict those cycles. We hope they'll never happen again, but you know, if history repeats itself, we certainly will. And uh, also, uh, this last decade, of course, had two, uh, two recessions. Uh, and we're actually down 45% you know, from the peak back in the heyday of the 50-seaters uh, uh, when uh, there was uh, over 600 airplanes produced in this market segment. You know, we keep track of uh, sort of the key uh, indices you know, for the uh, market, uh, what's happening with load factors. You know, we tend to compare this uh, to uh, prior uh, periods, similar periods. Um, it's sort of at the lower uh, range. You know, these days, airlines need to have 70, 75% load factors to break even. When I came into this industry, uh, if you got to 60%, you were making money. Now, uh, you know, the business models changed a lot. So at 73%, they're probably close to a break even mode, which is not where we want them. We want them, uh, you know, up uh, to the mid 70s or above. Uh, this year now, 2011, IATA's come out with a new profit forecast, which is actually down from 2010, and that's because of the uh, increased uh, price of oil. Uh, it's still positive, <coughs> which is a good thing. You know, last year was the, uh, the airline set a record, uh, like 28 billion operating profits, but it's still a very, very thin margin. Uh, Orders are starting to rebound, but still at lower levels you know, as we try to climb out of the cycle. And uh, Mary had already talked about the oil prices, which uh, have been as high as 110. I think they're back down around 100 these days, but that's still 
uh, significant. And oil prices really are so important now in the overall health of the industry and the health of the airlines and their order uh, activity. Uh, Mary said that 107 over the next 20 years. You know, we just recently been at 110. 107, by the way, I think is all in 2010 dollars. So you have to remember that it's in a constant dollar, not an escalated dollar. And uh, and if you look back, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, too long ago we were actually back down around 60. And uh, and then uh, last year around 80. And uh, you know, who knows where we're going to be? But the problem is when it shoots up this fast. The airlines just can't adjust. There's no way that they can increase fares, you know, adjust their capacity, et cetera, uh, as fast as the oil price goes up. They do hedge, uh, but it, it hits their bottom line hard, and uh, and it's a problem for them. So uh, where, so the volatility of oil prices is almost more important than the actual oil price because you can adjust to the oil price over time with new airplanes like we have. But you can adjust within a few months, and that's uh, that's the problem. Um, I would also just add that uh, you know in our market uh, we've been maintaining our relative uh, you know, market shares, and uh, and if you look at it on a delivery basis, which you should look at, because orders are lumpy, and uh, it's hard to you know get a good reading uh, when you look at just orders. But you know these days, when on the regional uh, side we're roughly a third of the market, that's where we intend to stay uh, on the jet side, and uh, around 50% on the uh, turboprop side. So uh, that's uh, uh, important for us to uh, retain those uh, leadership uh, positions. So if I shift to the uh, the forecast itself. Uh, and you look at these key parameters that I've already just alluded to. Uh, if you looked at overall economic growth, 3.4%, pretty strong. So that's good for our outlook. If you look at the volatility, it's very volatile on oil. That's not good. Uh, if you look at fuel prices, if they actually escalate slowly over time, it's, sort of, it's good for us because people need more fuel-efficient aircraft. We have the most fuel efficient aircraft in our segment. So escalating oil price is actually a good thing from our perspective as long as it happens in a more predictable, measurable uh, way. Uh, replacement, I'll show you in a minute, uh, you know, over half of the aircraft in our segment are going to be replaced over the next 20 years. That's positive. Emerging markets is very positive. Environmental regulations are uh, positive because we have the most environmentally friendly aircraft in our city. Uh, but if the governments get too carried away and start taxing you know, the uh, emissions uh, too high, too quick, like, that can be bad. So uh, you know, this is already an industry that's uh, second to none. Well, actually, it's second to uh, cigarettes and alcohol. That's the only other industry that actually has higher taxes than the aviation industry. So uh, we don't want governments to get any more carried away than they already have in terms of their taxation. And, uh, and of course, we, uh, we predict that scope clauses will continue to be relaxed. History is on our side uh, in this case, and, uh, and we would expect that because that general economics would, uh, would suggest that. You know, arbitrary barriers to you know, real economics uh, don't last, don't tend to last. But, uh, <clears throat> but a lot of the labor unions try hard to make them last, but we think that they'll get relaxed. So when you put all that together, you know, we're saying uh, that over the next 20 years, uh, the, the industry is going to need 13,100 aircraft in this uh, 20 to 149 seat segment. That's up just slightly over our last year's forecast, about 300 aircraft. Uh, most of that basically is in the 100 to 149 seat segment. Uh, but it's just a modest increase. And it you know, makes sense as you continue to have economic growth, you continue to move the base up, just the math would drive a uh, slightly higher uh, market forecast, and that's exactly uh, you know, what we're predicting. 
Uh, what you can also see here is that uh, from the 11,000 airplanes that we uh, have operating in the segment today, uh, we'll add the 13,100 uh, deliveries, but then we'll retire another 6,700 aircraft and uh, uh, end up at 17,400 aircraft in uh, 2030. Uh, and this is driven by the different regions of the world, maybe we talked about. Uh, North America, which has the you know, highest installed base, but uh, a relatively low uh, GDP forecast, uh, will still be the number one market uh, for the next 20 years. So 4,800 plus uh, units will be uh, required in uh, North America. But China now has really come from way behind. So talk about emerging markets. And they're now the uh, second largest uh, economy in the world, and they're still growing. I think it's just under 7%. Uh, so they're going to drive up their, uh, their uh, demand significantly, and they'll slightly exceed uh, Europe, which is uh, the second highest installed base uh, today. Uh, and, but there are other very important markets to us in uh, you know, Latin America, Middle East, uh, North Africa, Asia Pacific, the rest of the world. Really. So the rest of the world is you know, catching up to North America and, uh, and Europe. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, if you look at this 13,100 airplane uh, demand, uh, just about half of that is going to come from retirements and uh, the other half will come from growth. Uh, places like uh, United States and Europe will be driven mostly by retirements. Uh, the rest of the world will be driven mostly by growth. Sort of makes sense, and uh, I think that's of uh, no surprise uh, to you. And uh, only 4,300 of those 11,000 uh, 11, airplanes will be uh, flying uh, 20 years from now. Uh, and a lot of this, uh, of course, a lot of the replacement and, and the growth as well is being driven by the uh, higher fuel prices. When you look at cash operating costs today, in a, in a North American environment, fuel is now 50% of the cash operating costs. The other half is really maintenance and fees and crew. Uh, when you come to Europe, because the uh, fees are higher in Europe, uh, fuel is probably around 40%, maybe a little less where fees increase uh, their fraction relative to fuel. Maintenance stays about the same. Uh, but fuel is now the dominant factor in an airline's planning uh, for a new aircraft when they look at cash operating costs. And, uh, and of course, all you have to do is go back and look at what it used to be, early part of this decade, really at kind of historical lows, uh, $26 a barrel. You put that in real terms, it was a historical low. So 50 seaters made a heck of a lot of sense back then. Um, and, uh, and now if you look at last year, it was at 79. And as we mentioned, we're forecasting 107 as we go forward. So uh, that means a lot of the older, very fuel inefficient aircraft uh, no longer make sense. And uh, a lot of the smaller uh, regional aircraft no longer makes sense because they're, they're no longer profitable. So one way to look at this is to break it down and, uh, and so you can look at what's happening within our forecasts. So if you look at the 50 seaters essentially in that 20 to 59 seat segment, we have a lot of airplanes operating today, 3600, uh, but uh, we see uh, very, a very small need for additional airplanes. 300. It's almost uh, insignificant. It is insignificant. But what's going to happen is uh, about 2,500 of those are going to get retired. And uh, there'll be a balance of around 1,500 where they'll fly in these small, uh, very thin, high yield markets where you can still make money with a uh, small airplane. Uh, but everything's going to migrate to bigger regional jets. And uh, so if you look at the at the 60 to 100 seats, um, which is at 2,200, 
that's going to uh, grow significantly. 5,800 new deliveries, very few uh, retirements, relative uh, retirements. And so uh, we're going to end up at uh, 6,800. So we're going to triple the number of large regional jets in the world over the next 20 years. You know, a big number. And, uh, and by the way, this, our overall market represents uh, a little over $600 billion. Uh, and actually, precisely, it's like $639 billion. And I hate being pre using precise numbers like that because it's precisely wrong. But it's approximately correct. You can, you can, and, uh, and so uh, about $200 billion of that, a little more, is going to be in this regional aircraft market for the 5800. And then the C-Series market accounts for a little over $400 billion. And, uh, and of course there's 5200. Uh, big demand for these uh, aircraft 7000. Uh, you can see that over 3000 will retire and uh, will end up at 9200. So about a 75% increase in this uh, fleet size. So obviously uh, you know, these two markets are the ones we're focused on and we have uh, great products uh, to address those. And uh, so our future, uh, the market demand, the need for aircraft 60 to, to 150 seats is, uh, is great. So the future is very bright. Uh, what you need though are products, right, that, uh, that are optimized for these market segments. If there's one thing I've said time and time again, and one thing I want you to write down and remember, is that Bombardier provides an optimal solution for each one of these market segments. So we provide optimal regional aircraft, and we provide the optimized uh, aircraft for the 100 and 149 seat market now, which is, uh, which is the uh, C-Series. Um, and here's a clever co cover page. I think there's. I think these are pictures of uh, Switzerland. Right? Okay, and uh, and pictures of our, our product. I can't attest to the Switzerland, but it looks kind of like Swiss pictures. And uh, but I can't attest to the airplanes. <laughs> so uh, let's let's uh, you know let's talk about this a bit. Um, I want to talk about our turboprops, which is becoming more and more a uh, key part of our uh, future more and more a part of the airline's plans. Um, talk about the uh, CRJ-1000, which has now you know, been in operation for you know, roughly uh, six months. Uh, and we'll talk about the C-Series. Uh, and I'll talk about them all in the context of an optimal solution for uh, these market segments. If you, uh, if you look at the uh, Q400, uh, you know, we've had some pretty significant orders recently. So uh, Air Canada Jazz ordered uh, 15, and they'll be putting those into operation very soon. Uh, so they've been a big operator of uh, one, two, three hundreds over the years, and now they're going to move into the larger uh, uh, 400 uh, product. So uh, this is a you know, real big uh, step for them, for us. You know, we're expanding our uh, customer base. And, uh, and uh, I guess they call themselves Air Canada Express now. I've got to get away from jazz. But uh, uh, at the same time, we had another breakthrough order in India uh, with SpiceJet, which is really the most profitable airline in India. Um, and they're now going to put the uh, Q400 really into a low fare carrier environment. They're going to use Q400s like they use 737s. And, uh, and they're going to drive these airplanes hard. And they love them because they're, you know, fuel efficient, they're cost efficient, and uh, and they're reliable. They're becoming very reliable. I'll be the first to admit that they haven't been as reliable as they should be, sort of uh, here before, but uh, but we're uh, getting there. In addition, uh, we have uh, airlines now who are looking at putting uh, the uh, Q400 into a two-class configuration. And actually, we have a customer that's going to introduce this new two-class here in the not-too-distant future. So the, so the Q400s, in a North American environment, especially where two-class is important, you know, will be uh, 
configured just like regional jets are today. And the fact of the matter is, you know, the Q400s are going to replace a lot of those 50-seaters that I talked about. So when the airlines go to bigger regional aircraft, it isn't going to be always bigger regional <coughs> jets. It's going to be bigger regional turboprops because turboprops have the fuel efficiency uh, that uh, it's better than a jet, you know, under uh, 500 nautical miles. And, uh, and you hear a lot still, maybe not so much anymore, but uh, about you know, the new open rotor, unducted fan engines that uh, they may put on jets one of these days. Well, guess what? It exists today, the Q400. That's the unducted fan. And there is no more fuel efficient uh, aircraft engine than a turboprop. That's why they keep wanting to put them on jets. It's just it doesn't work very well. They can't uh, integrate it on the airplane well. They're too noisy. They're too slow. And, uh, but they work great. On, uh, on regional aircraft. Uh, the other thing is we're uh, doing is we're improving the navigation systems on the uh, Q400. Uh, we're continuing to improve on the fuel efficiency. You know, we uh, introduced the next gen uh, here uh, a while ago and uh, with 2% better fuel efficiency. Today uh, we're seeing another 1.5% better uh, above that. And the airlines are loving it. We're also doing things like uh, putting drop-down oxygen uh, in the cabins so we can sell uh, turboprops. You know, they fly at 25,000 feet, not at 35,000 feet. And, uh, and so if you go into a very mountainous region and, and in the remote case where you might actually lose uh, uh, you know, pressurization in your, in your oxygen, you have to drop down to a low... Uh, Altitude. Well, if there's a mountain in your way, you don't want to do that, right? So uh, you want to keep flying at a higher level, and so now we're going to have oxygen in the cabin so you, so you can get away from the mountain, and then you can drop down. I think we can do that for about 22 minutes. Um, um, so the turboprops are evolving, getting better, and you're going to ask me this question later, so I'm going to answer it for you right now. And of course, we have a bigger uh, Q400 in mind. Uh, you know, there's definitely a future for a 90 seat uh, Q400, and uh, and it's uh, probably sometime in the second half of uh, this decade. Uh, and we expect that we'll have a competition too. If I look at the 1000, uh, which has been flying for about six months, uh, this is really a great success story. We talked for about nine months about the fact that we were late, and uh, and that was not a fun conversation. But now that it's in service, the conversation has gotten a whole lot more fun. And uh, and all you need to do is talk to uh, Brit Air and Air Nostrum, and what they'll tell you is that the airplane is actually getting four percent better fuel burn than we advertise, um, and with the better aerodynamics, etc. They're getting six percent more range combined with that fuel burn. Uh, the airplane is actually operating at uh, close to a hundred percent schedule uh, completion reliability, but uh, you know on a dispatch reliability uh, basis, it's uh, like ninety nine point four, ninety nine point five. It's our best performing airplane right now in the uh, regional uh, jet family. So it's uh, doing quite well and. Um, this is going to, this is gaining, you know, more attention, more interest from the airlines, and uh, bodes well for the future of this product, uh, and the uh, need for those 5,800 uh, regional aircrafts that I talked about, and of course the C series. Uh, so we're, you know, roughly halfway through our development phase on the C series. Remember, it was a five and a half year uh, program at the beginning. And, uh, and I'm here to say that we're going to deliver on all these requirements that we uh, set out at the very beginning. We said in order to have a game-changing airplane, you had to deliver you know, on these uh, seven points. And we're going to deliver on every single one. Uh, so it's truly going to be the game-changer that uh, we uh, set out to be. 
And the program, you know, at this point is really gaining momentum because it's, uh, it's becoming much more real. Like every new airplane program, it's becoming much more real to all of us, to all of you, especially to the customers. I mean, you can actually start to see, you know, parts and uh, uh, pieces of the airplanes coming together. What you see on this particular, uh, this particular chart, not the last one, is, uh, is uh, a manifestation of what I just said. So, uh, you know, at the bottom of the chart there, what you see is a uh, pre-cooler. It goes on the engine and, uh, uh, a, you know, a valve that controls the uh, airflow from the engine to the aircraft and the engine. And all of this is going to, is going on the Pratt & Whitney test bed here in the next, uh, uh, month or two uh, to begin flight test. In the engine you see there will be the second engine uh, that they built, the second C-series engine that they built. Uh, actually they were going to use uh, the third engine for this, but this first one did so well that they decided to use the second one for uh, flight test, which is an indication of how well the uh, engine development is going. Uh, you know, At the top of the chart you see uh, the uh, cockpit skin and uh, you know, other uh, you know, parts of the cockpit structure that's beginning to go into our test rig. Remember we have this complete integrated aircraft system test area and included in there we have an actual, in the old days we called it an iceberg. Uh, bird. You know, today we call it ISTCR, Integrated System Remind me, John, with the acronym. But uh, we got it. we've got too complicated. We got too sophisticated. It's an iron bird, okay? And uh, and uh, and so these parts are going on to that iron bird. So we'll actually, you know, start to prepare to fly this airplane for the. F we'll fly the full airplane in this uh, test lab uh, before we ever fly it. Take or do a first flight, and then you'll see uh, uh, parts also for uh, the uh, wing that are coming together. So it's becoming real. Uh, and we are progressing on the certification side. What is really exciting, China's the number two market, right? Guess what? China wants to work with us and certify the C-Series in China. And so uh, we recently added them. Um, with the agreement of uh, Transport Canada, to our certification uh, process, to our certification team. And so as we move towards the uh, certification of this aircraft, China will be prepared, uh, or will be prepared to certify this aircraft you know, with the Chinese authority for airlines in China. And so now we have the FAA, TC, CAC, and the ESA working on the program. Uh, we are you know, advancing in uh, each of our facilities. Uh, so uh, Saint Laurent, some of you have been there. That's where we do uh, a lot of our fabrication, build components, build the cockpit. Uh, we're going to build the uh, the aft fuse there as well, the composite aft fuse, so the non-pressurized section of the aircraft. And uh, so we have new. Uh, we've been we've been uh, upgrading the facilities, uh, putting in new robotic equipment. Um, Implementing our state-of-the-art lean manufacturing, uh, our achieving excellence system, you know, and you can go there and see that. Uh, we're, you know, advancing further uh, the facilities in Mirabel. So right now we're modifying existing facilities, which is where we're going to assemble the test aircraft, and then uh, sh soon thereafter we'll be, uh, put the new facilities in place to uh, for the uh, uh, new aircraft. Uh, production aircraft, and uh, so we're perfecting our, uh, you know, our, our assembly and delivery process uh, with uh, the systems, uh, Katia, Delmia, uh, and uh, that's all progressing. In uh, you're going to go see Belfast, you're going to be impressed. You know, this is the single largest. You keep me straight on this. This is the single largest investment ever made in uh, Northern Ireland. And it's, uh, 
it's a half a billion pounds. And uh, today, I think pounds are like 1.67 or something like that, U.S. dollars, so you can do the calculation. Um, and 600,000 square feet. And what's going in there are you know, big rigs like this where the wing is going to be assembled. This is going to be a state-of-the-art facility uh, for the all-new composite uh, wing. Um, and we're engaged with our customers all through this process. I mean, just uh, in the first half of this year, we've had uh, three, you know, what we call airline advisory councils. Uh, one was in uh, uh, held in Belfast. One was uh, recently held in Montreal. One just last week was held in uh, Singapore. We have 30 customers helping us perfect this airplane, you know, to their requirements. And believe me, they're really uh, excited about it. And uh, so. To summarize, we've, we've, uh, we've uh, demonstrated the key technologies that are going on to this aircraft. And you can see it, you can feel it, you can kick it, and uh, you, can, you can see the results. So they you know, include uh, uh, taking a, 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 a wing, an all-composite wing, to ultimate load, which is 150% of limit load, so you got to write all this down, <laughs> because limit load is the most you'll ever expect to see in flight. So this air, this wing has been tested to 150 percent of that, and it did not break. You know, you designed to where maybe it should break at 150 percent, so it didn't break. So now it means we can take a little weight out. We overbuilt it. Engineers have a tendency to do that, by the way. And so, uh, and we also prove prove uh, prove out all our uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, you know, I talked about uh, the AFUs, uh, so we proved out that technology. We have a fly-by-wire uh, simulation uh, lab in, uh, in San Diego. So we're talking about San Diego lunch. So this might become a new uh, feature attraction, maybe, at, uh, in San Diego. And, uh, but with Parker, our supplier, you know, we're testing out the new uh, systems and control laws for the fly-by-wire C-Series. I talked about the engine. We have uh, over 250 hours on the first. Now, now we're 50 hours on the on the second. Uh, we've had a uh, our uh, metallic aluminum lithium uh, forward barrel and test in uh, Saint Laurent for uh, it's going getting close to a year, which is produced in Shenyang, China, and uh, we now have 160,000 cycles. So we're going to go to 180. That's three lifetimes, and. Uh, and we've learned a lot from that, and we've actually built a second wing to, uh, to uh, simulate the uh, wing body joint, wing the center uh, wing box joint, which is like the most critical part of the uh, uh, assembly process, uh, and we proved all that. The, uh, I won't say too much more about the engine, I've already covered all this, it's just going to fly soon. Um, so, uh, next chart just says, uh, all of this together is really creating the momentum uh, that we want, expect, at this uh, time of the program. So whether it's parts, uh, the new uh, certification plans with China, whether it's uh, facilities, whether it's uh, technology demonstrators, uh, it's all happening as we speak and the C-Series is becoming very, very real. Now, I made a little bit of a jab at my good friends at Boeing, and, uh, and they are good friends, and they've had a big challenge with the all-new technology uh, 787. By the way, I'm very thankful to Boeing. Bombardier, in a lot of ways, is very thankful to Boeing for, you know, for developing that all-new technology 787 because uh, they applied it first to a big airplane like the 787. We're taking virtually all those same technologies and applying them first uh, to a single aisle aircraft. And uh, so we had a chance to learn a lot from them. We have a lot of the same suppliers. And so we benefit from a lot of the you know, challenges that they had. Uh, you know, our, we still have remaining challenges. Well, I often say that uh, Boeing is, uh, operates on the bleeding edge of technology, and, uh, and where Bombardier operates is on the leading edge of technology. 
So uh, you need $60 billion companies around to uh, operate on the bleeding edge. Uh, it's, uh, good for, it's good for all of us. But now, uh, you know, we have to execute, and, uh, and so we're on this journey through our five-and-a-half-year program. Uh, we're into 2011 where we're actually completing all the demonstrators that I talked about. We're releasing the detailed designs. We're building parts. And uh, the first parts of which will go into our complete integrated aircraft system test area uh, by the end of this year as we move into next. So we can, by the, uh, uh, by the middle of, no later than the middle of next year, have a fully functional uh, uh, tested airplane in, uh, uh, on the ground. We call it basically, you know, flight test vehicle zero. And we're going we're gonna to test the airplane 100 percent so that we, as we move into uh, first flight and, and uh, flight test, it's going to be nothing more than uh, uh, flight uh, validation. So first uh, flight still scheduled for the uh, end of next year, uh, entry into service for the 100 the end of the following year, and then the 300 at the end of the year after that. Uh, we would just add that uh, uh, you know, we're investing, at the same time we're doing this, we're, uh, Bombardier is becoming more and more global all the time. And, uh, and so uh, you may have seen recently where we announced a, a framework agreement with, uh, with COMEC. Uh, we're also expanding uh, our sales team in China and we're expanding uh, the customer services support team. James is going to talk about that. We're doing the same thing in the Middle East and uh, Africa, Europe. Russia, CIS, Asia Pacific. So we we are you know recognizing the global nature of our business, the fact that uh, Bombardier needs to be global, and we're investing in all these uh, regions because these are the emerging markets. These are the fastest growing. Go back to the chart that uh, Mary was showing. These are the fastest growing regions of the world, and we need to be there. We need to be more than just North America and uh, and Europe. And you can look at our footprint. Uh, and look at where we have uh, um, our diff different uh, distribution centers, our different uh, uh, facilities for uh, maintenance, uh, uh, where our regional uh, service uh, offices are, and uh, so forth. And we're becoming a very global uh, uh, business, which uh, again James will uh, will talk about. So it is becoming very real. So delighted you could join us today. Hopefully you'll feel a bit of what I'm talking about, but uh, and tomorrow you'll be able to really get your hands on uh, on the wing uh, jigs and um, and other facilities that I alluded to. But also, I know you all want to come to Paris, so I want to make sure you come and visit us at the air show, and uh, we're going to have a, a pavilion there where we'll have our you know, updated uh, uh, mock-up. So we've updated our mock-up to make it uh, exactly like the uh, airplane. We're going to have, uh, you know, other. We'll have like the really uh, first look at a the uh, handicap lab, etc. That'll be on this airplane. Those are part of the new regulations, and uh, we'll give you uh, a look at what the cockpit's going to look like. So, uh, so. Uh, You'll get uh, you'll be able to talk about the airplane uh, with as much uh, enthusiasm and uh, you know sense of uh, reality uh, that I do. So please visit us. And as we tell everybody, you know, great minds uh, think ahead. So this is all about the future. So we're talking about the next 20 years. The C series is going to be a huge part of the next 20 years. You know, it's leading the way in the single aisle market and. Uh, and we couldn't be more excited. And we include you in this great minds uh, term. You, you agree? You should be there? Okay, so great minds. Think ahead. All right. So uh, a lot of material there. Uh, hope you can follow it with me. Now we'll switch over to uh, you know, the business aircraft, the real sexy stuff.